Welcome to the second session in today. Uh, we have a panel in this session, and we titled the panel 78 uh, Records as a Source for Ethnomusicology and Ethnochoreology, and subtitled The Slovenian Case. Uh, all four presenters are members of the uh, Research Center of Slovenians and uh, Slovenia Academy of Sciences and Arts. So Mojca Kovacic, Ursa Šivic, Rebeka Kune, and myself, uh, Drago Kune. And we will present four topics or four views or four case studies uh, of this Slovenian case. But at, at the beginning, I will try to explain a little bit about this Slovenian case at the background, uh, because all four, we are using material from the digital collection of gramophone records. It is a rather new collection in our archive. Uh, in Slovenia, it is Digitalna Zbirka Gramofonski Plošč, or in short, DZGP. Even for us, it's difficult to say, but it's so useful because it's short. So this means digital collection of the gramophone records. And it is the largest virtual collection of 78 recordings of Slovenian material. Uh, there are various musical genres in this collection from the earlier period of commercial sound recordings till let's say uh, 1940 or the beginning of the Second World War. This was the focus. I will later explain a little bit about this. And we are especially proud of extensive metadata documentation, which is connected to this uh, collection. So we are all using this kind. Uh, I have to say that this is a result of now I can say many years of systematic research and collecting activities of this material and in collaboration with many institutions and experts in Slovenia and especially abroad. And I've, I'm sure we have to at least mention some of, of them. Some of them are also present here. Uh, we start to collaborate with uh, Franz Lichleitner, with Alan Kelly, uh, Pekka Grono, and many others, so thank you very much. And also colleagues from Zagreb, uh, co colleagues who work here yesterday from Velimir Kraker. Uh, I started for many years to, to visit him, uh, Velkuli Puščak, Ivan Mirnik, and many others. So without these persons and other, uh, uh, we certainly will not have such a collection or such a metadata and such a knowledge. Uh, collection is based on the material collected in the research project <coughs> named Sound Material from Phonograph Records as a source for ethnomusicology and folklore research, which started in 2009. It was quite early, so 15 years ago. And it, it is interesting how time is changing even now, <coughs> because when we start, there was almost no records available on YouTube or the database, Alan Kelly's uh, co collection and so on. So everything was by mail or direct contact. So it was, I will say, different time when we started. Now it's much easier. A little bit of background. I can say that in Slovenia there is almost or was almost no interest in 78 records. Still now we have no record collector, not any. And at the time, almost no collections of records in institutions. I will illustrate this with an interesting article of the musicologue uh, Andrei Riavec. In 1994, he published an article, a short article, and he said that in Slovenia, only two institutions have Slovenian 78s. First institution is Academy of Music, and they, uh, they have one record. And the other is Slovenian Theater Museum, they have 24 records. So altogether, 25 records. 
I don't want to excuse, but usually we use it as excuse. Slovenia is small, geographically small. You can see here this red dot <laughs> in the Europe, and there's only 2 million people. So we say, okay, 25 record, it's, it's enough for us. <laughs> uh, so we, our perspective, when we start our collection, we, we start from another point of view. So we started to collect information metadata knowledge uh, and we built the ZKP at its, its now which uh, contains over 2700 documented discography units so not 24 2700 uh, about 1300 sound recordings and more than 3000 units of visual material so scans photograph and so on uh, it's not necessary to say that it is unique, important segment of cultural heritage, uh, but it is important to say that it's a digital collection. So all the materials in a digital form, mostly. Uh, and what is interesting for our research, that surprisingly large number of these records contains traditional music. And we also, as you see from the title of the uh, our project, we focus on this kind of material. Uh, here is a, a small collection of some uh, labels, and I want to play a, a short piece of instrumental music recorded in Ljubljana in 1908, so it's quite early. <laughs> record from the early period connected with traditional Slovenian traditional music. We can say that in our collection we have two main areas where uh, were recorded. One is Europe from recordings from Ljubljana, Zagreb, Vienna, Berlin, Budapest, so these big uh, cities. And another is the United States uh, where recordings were made by immigrants. Uh, in New York, Chicago, Cleveland, and so on. So each has some characteristic. I will very briefly uh, just uh, noted that these are in Europe. Usually, they are early recordings. Uh, a lot of them recorded before the World War One, uh, and usually they are opera singers, theater actors, bands, as usually was who performed in those days. Uh, and this is mostly uh, uh, acoustically recorded material. In the United States, uh, recordings uh, are from uh, immigrant music, Slovenian immigrants in the United States. Uh, most of these recordings were made uh, in between the both worlds, and they are mostly electrically recorded. And all, of course, contains quite a lot of uh, traditional music or music connected to traditional music. I know it is difficult to say what is Slovenian and what is traditional, so I will not go deeply in this, but somehow you understand uh, the focus. The, the heart of our uh, the collection is a database. Uh, at the beginning, we create, let's say, a simple database uh, with data, metadata, with active links to sound, to picture. So it's very useful, but it's not user-friendly and it's not certainly for public access. Uh, so we still use it, but we are now doing uh, our uh, effort of spending money and time uh, how to publish this material in uh, online, in user-friendly environment. I will not talk about this. Uh, you know the problem. <laughs> so the big challenge uh, was how to collecting 
uh, how to collect and uh, linking together various information from various sources. So one source, of course, is a disk itself, contains sound, label, and around the label with a lot of information, and other, a lot of other sources. I will briefly go, uh, touch a little bit uh, the sources. So maybe just a label. I here I present the same recording, the same song with the same metrics, uh, reissued in a four different labels in four different uh, time period. So probably this was very uh, well accepted and uh, nice song that they were published during 20, 30 years, the same song. <coughs> Trade catalogs are a great uh, source of information. They are special uh, catalogs of Slovenian records with some pictures uh, and so on. So, newspapers, we already heard quite a lot about this. Uh, no, there's no uh, uh, colleagues from Prague. Here is Diego Fuchs, they mentioned in their presentation. In the first year when the first Slovenian recordings appear in Ljubljana, the Fuchs, uh, Diego Fuchs, offered in our uh, newspaper, Slovenets, Novi Ljubljanski Kumadi, so news uh, uh, songs uh, from Ljubljana, and he could be purchased in his uh, store in Prague, Moscow, and so on. So many information. Already, as, uh, discographies which are available, we have a small discography in our national library, the LEAP, and of course, very important, very useful discography of American historical recordings, where also some Slovenian uh, recordings are listed. This is hard to obtain, preserved documents for record companies, but sometimes you can find some information already published from some ledgers or cards or something. And of course, we try to edit, collect various literature and other sources. Uh, a lot of this was already published. It is only difficult to, to read all the things and combine and collect, but there's a lot of information. So I will repeat, maybe I think Ferenc was who, who mentioned that if you are doing researching this kind of material, cooperation is most important. So I will uh, agree with this and say yes. And to conclude, I'm very happy to say that we have some results of our project. We also already published some of them. Uh, uh, thematic journal Tradiciones, or maybe uh, here is a monography about Hoyer. You will hear about this Hoyer Trion and uh, Matt Arco, and some other papers which we are already published about this material. And I think now it's time to go to our presentation. So, first will be Moitza, Moitza Kovicic, uh, and she will talk about music society, Glasvena Matica, and records of this uh, society. So please, Moitza, the floor or the Zoom is yours. Yeah. Hello, can you hear me well? Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm really sorry I cannot be with you, but I, I got uh, ill or sick uh, just before I had to go to Zagreb, so I'm really happy I have this opportunity to be with you online to follow. And I congratulate all of you for organizing such a symposium and to uh, everything works very fine, I think. And now I will move to my uh, presentation. I will share the screen and sound, of course. So just tell me if everything is okay. Can you see? Yes. Okay, thank you. And I will start now. I I'll just go off with the Okay. Um, okay. 
So, uh, as Drago mentioned, part of the music production of uh, uh, recorded material was recorded by foreigner record companies in Slovenia at the beginning of 20th century. And this part was also made by uh, influential, then influential music society, Glasbena Matica. I made my case study out of these recordings. Um, you can actually uh, uh, you can actually explore several levels, but I have focused on few of them. Uh, so I wanted to see how these recordings are reflecting the time in which they were made, uh, mainly through who was chosen to sing uh, to represent uh, the national so-called national music production of the time and what repertoire was chosen. And of course, um, uh, uh, of my very interest, it was the sound. So how this repertoire was sonically uh, presented or interpreted. So therefore to understand uh, the first, we must briefly touch upon the cultural, social and political background uh, that influenced this public representation of music during this period examined. Uh, so for those of you, not acquainted with the region, I just uh, say that um, um, we uh, the Slovenia was a province of Austro-Hungary, and um, this was the period marked by ideology of cultural nationalism, through which Slovenians uh, asserted their national identity uh, within the um, Austro-Hungary. And uh, cultural workers, either they were professional or amateur, they focused more on emphasizing what is Slovenian in our culture. So uh, mainly through the search for difference between Slovenian and other, especially German cultures, and also in the search of Slavic Slovenian elements in music and language. In this respect, uh, the advertisement of recorded uh, record dealers from 1908, um, I must mention that this is also the year that first recordings of Glasbena Matica were made in Ljubljana. So this advertisement is very illustrative. In the newspaper Slovenski Narod, one can read, we warn Slovenians who have a zonophone to order Slovene records because it's shameful that only German songs should continue to be listened to on zonophones in Slovene houses. So nationalization processes have taken place at various levels and I will concentrate actually on the role that a uh, folk song called Narodna Pesem had in this time. So. Um, uh, many uh, there were many collect collecting of folk songs and publication of folk songs in textbooks in songs books many choral arrangements were made uh, representations on stage and nevertheless it's pro production on gramophone records so it's not surprising as drago mentioned um, most part of the, these uh, recordings were consisted of folk songs arrangement and uh, together with other utilitarian music in so-called uh, Slovene spirit or national style, they say. So records were the ideal medium for the distribution and promotion of what was considered to be national within the mass culture. And at that time, Glasbena Matica was a leading society and a musical culture and identity center of the growing Slovenian national identity. So it could uh, be not surprising that they were chosen, I would say, also because of their quality uh, or their um, reputation of being quality in the music production of the time. Uh, so they were chosen to record some musical repertoire for foreign uh, gramophone companies. Um, so first in my in the project, I was trying to find as many information about the recordings of Glasbena Matica. And I did the search in uh, newspapers of the time, the chronicles of society, uh, correspondence of members of the society, catalogues and other existing suitable literature. And I got I got data um, about the recording sessions, but not, uh, the context. So um, I was quite disappointed. I didn't find anything in, in their correspondence or chronicles, as, except once they mentioned that they earned some 350 crowns for the recording session. So this, I would say, these recording sessions did not really resonate among uh, Glasbena Matica society, among performance or wider public. So I will focus on the data now in Ljubljana uh, from 
1908 and 1911, um, Gramophone Company and Favorite Record recorded, uh, but labels also showed that Glasben and Matica Quartet recorded also for the Capo Records and Lirophone. For the later, uh, no sound is preserved. Glasben and Matica appears in vocal performance, um, and which was their primary area of activity. And the recordings also feature the various singing groups of Glasben Amatica. One of them is the choir, you can see on the picture. Uh, at that time had um, between 149 and 174 members in the form of male, female and mixed choir. And of course, not all of them sang uh, in uh, recording sessions. Uh, the next one is the quartet of Glasben Amatica, um, also the most frequently featured on the recordings. And Quartet and the Choir, I must mention, were the established formation of Glasben Amatica. Um, as we know that many times this uh, bigger society had some smaller ensembles that used the same name and were formed out of larger choirs. Uh, so they represented the society and this type of uh, involvement was actually more feasible in terms of travel, funding, and of course, also in terms of recording. And the third one, uh, the picture is not from the recording session from Ljubljana, I just uh, took it from the web to illustrate. Uh, this is the octet or the Osmerospeu of Glasben Amatica, which seems to be a special formation for this occasion, because I don't, I, I didn't find any um, in newspapers or anywhere that this formation existed. Um, and we can just assume that technical limitations of acoustical recordings dictated the number of singers, and that's why Osmero Speu also recorded some of the um, songs. And here are the data. So on the left side, you see the vocal formation and then inventory of recordings in our database, and then how much of recordings we have for how much recordings we have the sound preserved, none for the octet, for example, what kind of uh, type of songs were recorded, and the year of recording. And so I would say that this repertoire uh, presents what, what I mentioned in the beginning of uh, my paper, so um, the sound of the national spirit, which was manifested in different ways, either through composed music of Slovenian or Croatian composers, uh, which were in many cases patriotic songs, uh, as we see the, in the repertoire of the octet. And as I already mentioned, arranged folk songs, which were often combined of several shorter song fragments in a, one song, we call this Venček, um, and also, as we heard also in this um, symposium, um, here we also can find many uh, combined combination of singing with comic, comical or spoken word. So singing uh, comic theater acted lyrics. Uh, they were also uh, uh, there are also sign, uh, some representations of uh, nationally recognized uh, folk customs. But um, yes, in, in further on, I will be more focused on interpretation of folk music, um, of interpretation of folk in the music. So I also compared the programs um, in the newspapers, uh, but I could only find program lists for, uh, for the choir. So I, I can say that uh, they did not uh, really specially prepare the repertoire for the recording sessions, but took it from the well-known and also more light-hearted part of the concert repertoire. So on the left and the right side, you can see uh, Slovenske Narodne Pesmi here. And in this program, the same uh, Slovenske Narodne Pesmi by, uh, arranged by conductor Matej Hubat. Um, so the next and the last step I will present here are interpretations of work song uh, arrangements. Um, so I observed the sound. Um, and I will just mention that, of course, choral uh, interpretations are different uh, from, from uh, today's choral interpretations, even though they followed musical scores. I, I checked on this, um, but their interpretation, I would say, is much more dramatic and much more expressiveness, uh, expressive, but I didn't focus really to analyze this uh, choral interpretations because I focused on the quartet. 
task, um, which was interesting for me because I could not find any correspondence scores for their interpretation in harmonized folk song collections of the time. And I, I could, on the first sight or the first ear, I could hear that they sing more spontaneous, uh, their expressiveness is closer to folk singing aesthetics, and also some styles uh, characteristic of folk singing are used. Uh, so I assume that most probably some, of the, at least some of the repertoire was sung without scores by ear and also taken from the everyday life experience of what we call folk singing in socializing circumstances. Uh, so if I relate interpretations uh, to the folk singing styles, I recognize some elements. For example, uh, they, they mostly they sing uh, ahead. We say uh, na pre, that means that one singer starts singing, um, uh, which introduced the intonation and the tempo of the song, but others um, join later to him. Uh, this is very uh, characteristic of Slovenian folk singing even today. Uh, then in some songs we can recognize stepwise singing. This is, um, this is an expression in, uh, uh, for folk singing in Slovenia when uh, stanzas are modulated. Each stanza is in different, uh, uh, starts with different intonation. Um, then they use really moderate tempo, sometimes very narrative and rubato singing. But of course, on the other hand, folk songs are being, I, I uh, use this uh, cultivated, I use this expression because I got it from the um, literature of that time uh, when they were discussing how, song, how folk songs has to be cultivated for the stage. Um, so they use the harmonization in the choral four part form. They use agogic and dynamic nuances as uh, folk singing uh, doesn't, and um, of course many theatrical elements, uh, as I mentioned before, like clashing of glasses, interludes, yowling, uh, imitation of the mooing of a cow, and so on. With these dramaturgical notes, they emphasize the peasant character of the folk. So for the uh, illustration, I have a sound ex two sound examples. Actually, I chose uh, the first one from, uh, of course, from the period after the Second World War, where we have many uh, uh, field recordings. I chose the same song just for you to, to compare the singing style of, of the same song that was sang by quartet and sang by folk singers. Uh, um, or I think it could still be uh, sang in the same way today. Uh, so. First, the folk singing group. And I will only present the first stanza, not to be too long. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Sorry. I'm sorry. And now I will move to the example of the quartet.
Okay. Uh, to conclude, for me, it was valuable both to read, to find, to search for the data, and above all, to hear this interpretation of, of, of songs at the time, how, for example, how folk songs were imagined, uh, how they wanted to present them to a wider audience, and last but not least, to hear the process of cultivation of these folk songs within the framework of national idea by the intellectuals of that time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as we uh, usually uh, make in uh, in this uh, conference, we will uh, ask for questions at the end of our panel. We call sometimes our uh, uh, examples are our, our uh, case studies are somehow interviewing and editing. So, uh, Moitza, I didn't introduce to each other. Moitza is a musicologist at our institute. She's also a director of the institute. And uh, now the, the next colleague is uh, Ursha Shivitz. She's also a musicologist uh, at our institute. And she is especially, uh, or focusing on vocal music so the topic is uh in vocal music on 78 so please Ursha floor is yours thank you, uh, thank you Drago and also thank you to Moitza to make an uh, introduction to the historical period of that time um uh, so uh, the key question that I interested uh, that interested me in the research uh, was as follows: uh, uh, Which were sources for singers to choose songs for seventy-eight RPM records? Uh, it turned out uh, that among the re records, uh, uh, the among recorded Slovenian vocal material, there are many the so-called folklorized songs. Uh, at that point, I, I probably I should explain what uh, this um, this uh, term means. In Slovenia, we use the term ponarodila pisum. In uh, literary, it means uh, a song uh, becoming uh, folk or traditional. So this was. Uh, of course, this process of becoming uh, popular or uh, composed artistic songs becoming traditionally it's uh, the process of every every uh, of each time, of course, of each period. But in Slovenia, it was very important, especially in, in that time, uh, which was explained by by Moisa, So the second uh, half of uh, 19th century and the beginning of uh, the 20th century. Uh, um, so uh, also th these uh, these songs were uh, um, usually uh, usually performed, also recorded as you will see, and uh, published and also researched. So it, this this was very important phenomena in Slovenia. So uh, it is a uh, uh, generally known um, uh, term in Slovenia. So if you say popular uh, uh, you know what what we mean. But we usually mean that this is the song from the second half of the 19th century. Okay. Uh, during the decades of ethnomusicological and folkloristic research at the Institute of Ethnomusicology, a series of studies on this phenomenon were re realized. But since recordings on 78 RPM records were not yet known at that time, this media was not considered as a possible transition of art music to traditional and vice versa. As in other cases, it was also typical for records with Slovenian music that besides traditional songs, a considerable share was represented by composed songs. I mean, author, author, uh, songs with known uh, uh, composer and, and uh, songwriter, the poem. Uh, these were composed in the style of romantic songs and were performed by soloists and duets accompanied by one instrument or smaller instrumental ensembles. Uh, for the purpose of uh, my music analysis, I choose some of the so-called folklorized songs. On the screen, you can see uh, the list of some recorded, uh, recorded folklorized songs and the, uh, the, uh, and the number of their re records and reissued copies or records. Uh, I don't know which is the best, the, the best name. So 
uh, uh, I will uh, talk about the uh, song Nayazero at the lake. Uh, so we have 13, 13 copies, uh, I mean, originals and, and um, reissued copies. Among the sources uh, from which singers could have taken songs for recordings, I found three possibilities. The first one would be singers' own music musical memories, then their concert repertoires, and finally printed songs. Uh, let me just add that uh, at that time, at the time I was researching this um, this topic, this was uh, ten years ago. I, I didn't find any scores uh, scores uh, that were uh, presented yesterday, uh, like uh, they were presented yesterday at the concert. So uh, maybe uh, maybe we'll find that uh, in some other other occasion. Uh, we can assume that the personal song heritage. Uh, was one of the sources for the recordings. That means the songs uh, were more or less sung from uh, memory of singers and partly maybe from a template. The hypothesis seems more likely when it was about national music, so when Slovenian singers performed Slovenian music. So this corresponds to, to the, the example Moica uh, presented uh, uh, in her uh, music example. Uh, uh, but among the first performers of Slovenian songs on 78 uh, RPM records were foreign, especially Croatian singers, just to name a few of them, Tosho Lesic, Emilio Blažević, Milka Polancer Šnajdova, Božovičar, and the uh, Quartet Lisinski. Considering this, it is perhaps a more certain hypothesis that the performers used arrangements or sheet music taken from songbooks. Since the Slovenian and Croatian culture space were closely connected at that time, many Slovenian songs, uh, as well, uh, traditional as well as composed, were published also in Croatian songbooks, to mention only two of them, uh, Kolo and Hrvatska Pjesmrica. <clears throat> it is... Uh, uh, it is easy to understand that popular and widespread songs appeared in these songbooks, and among them were, were also that we find recorded on 78 RPM records. So uh, I, I uh, put a uh, sign um, uh, with, with the titles, uh, uh, with the songs which are recorded on uh, 78. Uh, it is known that sometimes performers were asked asked by gramophone companies to choose works from their concert repertoire for recording. Archives, uh, archive sources that would confirm this are very rare, but nevertheless, the program of the concert performed by the Slovenian soprano Augusta Danilova in 1925 reveals that uh, she included songs, the poemi Pticica, oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, so she, she included songs, Zapoimi Pticica and uh, Natui Hlih, both in her live performers, performance, as well as in the selection for gramophone records. <laughs> so it also, uh, it again corresponds to the, the example Moica showed with, uh, with the concert of Glas Benematica uh, choir. For my music analysis, I choose three kinds of materials. One was printed song version, uh, its recordings on 78 RPM records, and <coughs> its variants sung by traditional singers, which were recorded by Institute of Ethnomusicology in Ljubljana. I intended to determine what do the similarities and differences between those three sources tell us about the question of whether the singers relied on written sources or whether they sang from their own memory. In my research, I analyzed several examples of folklorized songs, but here, due to the lack of the time, I focus just on one. The song Na Jezeru at the Lake was written by the Slovenian composer Miroslav Vilhar and was published, probably the first, uh, first time published in 1862. The song describes uh, the lake, mountains, the nature generally. And of course, these were very, very uh, important uh, topics for uh, you know, in songs of this uh, of this period, uh, mostly uh, 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 
connected to to uh, national uh, national movement in in Slovenia at that time. So after publishing in 1862, the song at the lake was uh, regularly reprinted in school songbooks and in Slovenian and foreign songbooks. There were also many other opportunities for the song to get popular and folklorized. For example, concerts of different cultural societies, political events, and personal culture and nationalistic <laughs> activities of the composer itself. The popularity of the song is also proven by numerous reprints in songbooks and in manuscript songbooks created by traditional singers. The song at the lake is therefore considered one of the most characteristic uh, Slovenian songs of the second half of the 19th century and later, not only in the con context of art music, but also in the repertoire of traditional singers. At the time of my research, uh, there were two audio recordings available. Uh, the first one is performed by Tosho Lesic and the second one by Milka Polancer Schneid, both of them uh, Croatians. I hope this uh, data, uh, biographical data, uh, are correct that they are Croatians. Yeah, Milka is Jewish, Croatian. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> For comparative analysis, I added three traditional song variants with the purpose to find out which of music parameters changed in the process of the oral tradition. <clears throat> so in music example, uh, the main melodic line uh, is to show the recorded performance, while the small notes indicate the melodic line as it is written in the original, composed original. We can see a mixture of the original and the folklorized song version. While traditional singers minimized a descending fifth, the sixth uh, here at the beginning, uh, they uh, diminished, uh, minimized it into a descending third. In 78 RPM records, the descending sixth is preserved from the original, but it is different with the rhythm. The dotted rhythm is added as well as in the traditional variants as on 78 RPM records. <clears throat> Uh, and of course, we uh, uh, we find similar changes changes also in the interpretation of Milka Polanzer Schneid. Let me just play a few uh, few uh, bars of uh, interpretation of Oshulisic. <laughs> shorten it uh, so to not be too, too... okay <laughs> it's very well known <laughs> um there's another uh, there's another interesting fact uh, we can find in presented recordings both recordings are identical to the version published in the song book Hrvatska Pjesmarica it is about the ending of the song uh, it is uh, the very uh, end <clears throat> um where the melody is repeated a, a third higher. Such a version is performed both by Milka Pulanzer Schneid and by Loso, uh, Tosho Lesic. Given that such an ending is not found either in the Slovenian songbooks or in traditional variants, it can be presumed that those artists, artists performed the song from sheet music, possibly published just in the Hrvatska Pjesmerica. Uh, while the first uh, publication of the song Nejezeru uh, at the lake did not have written interpretation markings, these were added in most of further editions, including in the aforementioned Hrvatska Pies Marica. Uh, I can assume that the interpretation markings were added only when a certain interpretation of the song was already widely fixed. Such an inter interpretive image is also revealed in the records of Tosho Lesic and Milka Polanzer Schneid. 
and also recordings of traditional variants of this song prove that this type of performance, so interpreted in interpreted interpreted form, was universally present. Due to, to the lack of the time, I had to reduce uh, the musical examples no, uh, to only one song, but anyway, I can give some more general conclusions. It is not possible to give an, an ambiguous answer to the question of how singers uh, choose songs for a recording on gramophone records. However, during the musical analysis, several parameters were extracted, which partially re reinforce the assumption that the singers relied on both written songs and their own musical memory. On the basis of the examined material, it could be assumed that the interpretation of the song became an inseparable element in the collective musical memory. Therefore, interpretation markings were added to the subsequently printed editions. Thus, it can also be concluded that Milka Polanser, Schneid and Tosho Lesic knew the song before recording it, as their interpretations are quite similar in terms of both dynamics and tempo. And tempo is another uh, parameter that argues the co co coexistence of folklorized songs and those recorded, uh, recorded on gramophone records. The tempo of records uh, and its traditional variants is around of uh, 54 beats per minute, which proves that the tempo was widely known both among art music performers and traditional singers. Uh, the main observation was focused on the phenomenon of folklorized songs and the question of how much the repertoire uh, recorded on 78 RPM records is a reflection of the popular repertoire at that time. Newly discovered records of Slovenian songs uh, uh, records definitely gave uh, new insight into the study of the song repertoire of the first half of the 20th century. If we claim that 78 uh, records summarized material from the popular song repertoire, then it is also uh, possible to change the point of view and try to answer the question if gramophone records as a new musical media opened the, the way to the popularization of music. Among the first customers of uh, gramophones and gramophone records in the early period uh, were uh, the wealthy, for example, traders, intellectuals, and innkeepers. However, music from gramophones also reached new listeners, especially in local inns, where gramophone records were used for entertainment and dancing, recorded music was encountered also to the rural population. Therefore, recorded music can definitely be placed alongside other media of popularization, such as songbooks, school singing, and various cultural events. Last but not least, this kind of research does not open only the question of the intertwining of art and traditional music, but also opens up the necessity of understanding the musical repertoire as a wider cultural space. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Ursha, very much. Uh, now we have uh, our next presenter, Rebecca Kune. Rebecca Kune is ethnochoreologist in our institute. And so we will have a first time, uh, I think it is, you are the only one in this conference who will connect research or directly connect 78s and dance. We, we talk a lot about dance uh, and uh, dance music recorded on 78s but this will be maybe topic about uh, how they or presumed how uh, this kind of records were used also to dance to them. Yeah. So please, Rebecca, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome to all here. I enjoy this days in Zagreb. Um, so, but my focus is not so much on gramophone as on dancing usually when I am researching. So, so when I see this uh, project, I was very curious, not about the record, but about the food. <laughs> so this is my perspective of, on gramophone record, and especially here is the statement "Plesna glasba u vlasti fundomu," what's mean uh, dance music in your own home? So 
this is how somehow connected my research interest. Um, to start, I was dealing with Slovenian folk dance tradition usually, and then was the project of 78. And my question was, how did the early Gremlin records influence traditional dance and in general dance culture? Because I think it's really two poles of everything. So um, let's go first to USA where it starts for me, my research. And this is the quotation from the one uh, catalog. With the help of Victor, you can hear the music of your native land and enjoy the best and most beautiful sounds of the land where you were born. <laughs> Refresh your memories of the distant days of your youth in a far off continent. The songs that you sang, and now it's mine, the music that you danced to is sung and played here by the best and most popular artists, your fellow countrymen. So it was for dancing. And it was a lot of times in America, in Slovenian newspapers in America, the gramophone records was also advertised as a dancing music. So, but anyway, I understand the gramophone records more like they were response to demand for the immigrants from rural part of Europe. And records was kind of, kind of um, kept to stay in touch with their culture and homeland. How it was like a very special, a special memory to homeland. And so I think they were identify, a symbolic identifier, kind of prestige, culture, capital in Bordeaux sense. But um, when we conducted the field research in Cleveland, I remember that some of them say, yes, I remember that they have a records, but they don't have a gramophone. So they just keep it the record as some symbol of prestige or something which is remembered. And in Cleveland, it's or in America or Canada, it's the same today with button bones accordion. Many of um, second, third generation, they want to have it in his house, but they don't know how to play it. So it's just an uh, object that identify with your ethnic roots in some way. So, and in the before Second World War, Drago already showed this catalog. Uh, you find these catalogs for uh, Slovenians in America, also the Hoyer Trio, which was uh, one of the instrumental trio, which was very uh, in my interest for a long time. Because this is the, um, the Hoyer Trio was made a lot of uh, music for dancing. Uh, recorded and it was accordion, banjo and guitar, which is not very, let's say, traditional Slovenian folk music band. So, uh, and they recorded in five years period, a lot of music, uh, most of them as a trio, but also met the leader, met uh, Hoyer also together with some singers or other musicians. So, they have a biggest selling hit was Dunay Ostane Dunay, which is known also in some other countries with a other type of the melody, and then Jack on Saint Clair Polka, Batnerus Polka, Zipolka, and so on. Um, among this uh, recorded material, there is also a lot of um, a lot of <coughs> dance tunes that are connected to uh, then traditional dance. One of these is a uh, poster dance. Poster dance is dance pillow dance. It's a dance game when you choose the partner. So, and the Hoyer Trio, actually, they made a recording of that. Hey, poster dance! This is the primo that okay, the more petali poster So it's the whole arrangement of how this dance uh, dance game is 
it should go with uh, some interactions, stopping with negotiating, for, and then you have to pay the musician for the solo dance and so on. Maybe just a short comment. Yeah. There was a kiss. Maybe you don't hear it at the end, because at the end, uh, when you chew, then it's a kiss, mm -hmm. and it was heard on the recordings. Yeah, but let's go from uh, Rio from America a little bit back in Europe. Actually, Matt Hoyer was, this is the artistic name of the musician in America, but in Slovenia, it was born as Matija Arko. And um, Boron was in Sodražica, in, so in Slovenia, which was in Dragos map, a small red, now we are just here. In the Slovene, this is the yellow in Slovenia and the red one is the Ribnica area. So he was born in Sodražica in uh, uh, 1891. And then he traveled to Cleveland as 14 years old boy, um, immigrated to USA with, with Havre, from Havre with a ship. And um, he was a accordion player um, he was a accordion player and brought tradition from home, actually. And he formed the Hoyer trio with his half brother. He has quite sad uh, life history because her mother was he was orphaned, and so the father invited him to USA, and he was married there with another. So it's a family story behind that. But the most important is that. It was one of the most popular bands in Cleveland in the 20s, let's say in 20s. So as you see in the American Slovenians newspaper, you can find the advertisement of the dance events, picnics, that Hoyer will be, Hoyer brothers will make sure that they will be dancing in a homely way. But at the same time, you can get also the advertisement in the uh, 1920s about already recorded music of them. And I like this advertised a lot because there is very rare, we have also the picture of the dance in the ads. So, but if you look at this, so it was, uh, look at this, musicians here, it's quite unusual uh, accompaniment because it's a violin, double bass, and I think a phone yeah. Yeah. or something like that. And actually this combination was never recorded in any of 78. So you have to know something. It's not just good to interpret uh, the advertisement sometimes. So, Hoyer Trio discography in a five years period, they made 99 recordings, 80 independent recordings of the trio, and 19 recordings in cooperation with other musicians and singers. And many records were reissued in Europe, but this is the Drago topic, so I will not <laughs> go in this details. But steaming, they were steaming from the experience of traditional Slovenian music. And a lot of so that's why I was so was so interesting in them because you find the uh, mazurka, poshta trans, the plan, saltish, uh, shushta polka, zibel shrit, uh, stairish, and so on, and different polkas and waltzes. So when I was looking on this 80 independent recordings, it is the uh, it is the, in the percentage is like this. So the most they uh, recorded polkas and then waltz, but I'm very focused on this folk dance part of their repertoire. Why? Because can tell something about Slovenian traditional dance as well. So let's go back to Slovenia. So uh, Itnur Choreology as a study was established together with uh, in the in the same time as um, Institute and also the this gramophone records in the first part of uh, um, 20th century and still today rely on field work uh, to the interviews, to own field research, to make kinetograms, field notes, sound recordings, etc., photos, rare video, 
till today, till 21 century, but never the mind. The oldest field recording of Slovenian instrumental instrumental folk music were made after 1955 on tape, magnetic tape recorder. So, and when the ethnochronology scholars use historical sources, they were looking for old newspapers, articles in journals, diaries, old photos, but never 78s. They were like overlooked as a source, even if as comparing source to these studies. That can be at least taken in account as some comparative. Why? Because why was this attitude? This is a quotation from the radio magazine in 1933. Um, it was written by ethnologist at that time and um, contemporary scholar of the um, Francais Marot, who was uh, the founder of Folklore Institute. And it was a long article and it was, I think, it, uh, this quotation shows the attitude of, let's say, Slovenian intelligentsia at that time in some way. So whatever is the cheapest for the foreign company and whether it sells the best is then recorded. And it's clear that the first rate things are not cheap and that what sells is bad, each rather than the good. So it was the complaining about, so why so many records are in uh, the radio? So we will, I will come back with this topic, but I think this was the issue that, um, and these questions were very raised among the scholars in the, that period, that this is something popular, new, and also after the Second World War, War they were beside the technical problems not to hear any more of this music, but also just this idea of um, what should be on record and what should not be on record, and what should be Slovenian in Slovenia, not in, by Slovenians in US, I think it is. So, but nevertheless, go back to my field in um, Sodrajica. So actually the research and systematic collection in this area where Hoyer Trio came, came from, it was made in the 60s and um, very new folklorist Baga Kumer wrote, um, he pu she published a book about folk music in that uh, Ribnica uh, Wally. And in that book, uh, the book is from 1968, um, he also present the folk dance repertoire of the beginning of 20th century in this area. And you can see this, I will not say the, all these names because then I make the comparison with the songs that Koya Trio uh, recorded. Uh, so dance tunes. And as you see, um, the Hoyer Trio recorded almost the same repertoire, only the, the orange I couldn't find on the Hoyer Trio uh, music um, record, so on the gramophone record. So almost the, all what was discovered by folklorists in the 70s was already recorded uh, 40 years before, or even more, 40 years, yeah. So, the advertising words became almost true in this case. So there is almost no song or musical piece which was ever composed that you and your friends are not able to enjoy if you only have Victor Victor at home. Mm -hmm. So it is really how much of the dance repertoire from Vinica region was already published there uh, in USA with the record. So, but it is important for me that the, uh, the dance repertoire in uh, Zmaga Kumar book was composed with the interviews of many the traditional musicians there. So one remembered three tunes, dance tunes, another musician remembered five tunes. And she, so she, she made a compilation of what was dance repertoire. On the other hand, you have a choir trio which just published almost everything. 
So, and I will give the two examples because uh, Matt Hoyer was born seven kilometers away where uh, Janes Champa, one of traditional musicians, was born. And actually, they were born in the same time. Uh, but the, this official archival material in our institute, it was uh, recorded in the 60s, but uh, Matt Hoyer recorded in New York in 1926. So let's. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I have to go back. And this is the Matt Hoyer. <laughs> So uh, me as a dancer, it's surprising how easy it is to dance to uh, Matt Coyle music and how sometimes it's difficult to, to dance on the recorded music of these folk musicians, but they were old, they were not skilled anymore. They were not, they were not regularly really practicing anymore, this music, but they were like, the researchers came and asked, do you remember what you was, what you were playing when you were young. So it's completely different if you are practicing all the time and then you go to make a record or you are just pulled out from the closet <laughs> and press to do a recording. So um, that's why I think it's very important source also for ethnochorology research, this kind of gramophone records to go further. So, Many records were reached in Europe and available for Slovenian citizens. Record stores in Ljubljana, uh, you can buy it, also Hoyer Trujano and other things. And they were broadcasted on Radio Ljubljana, uh, different rec gramophone records. So did gramophone records replace the role of musicians like live music for dancing and on radio? Yes. I don't know. According to this uh, this note in a magazine Radio Ljubljana, which says before the carnival time, our radio station received a long series of requests from of the owner of, of the Varens to provide a lot of dance music for the pre-holiday and especially for the carnival. Everyone wants to save costs for musicians, but what will the musicians say. Mm -hmm. So this is one aspect, but I think as from me, my perspective as a dancer, I don't believe that it's so easy just to put it gramophone on it. But in Radio Ljubljana, there are certain also the gramophone records. So you remember this quotation before, pray that they were opposed that gramophone record and so on. But in the 1930s, you can get uh, gramophone records, but I don't know what kind of gramophone records was there. Um, it's a half hour or one hour or even more like uh, gramophone records. It was stated just gramophone records. And just a few times it was stated also uh, that some what kind of gramophone record, but usually it was just like at the beginning of the radio broadcasting and someone in the middle. So, but in this magazine, when you have a schedule of the radio program, um, you get also some advertisement. And this is one of, from the Rasberger a sailor in Ljubljana. And it was said that all the records you hear on the radio are available brand new at the, our place. So let's go to Rasberger catalog and to his store. So Rasberger, for example, he published, I think, two or three catalogs. And um, they were Slovenian selling catalogs prepared in Ljubljana. And you can find the dance music in two sections. <laughs> the first was dance music, special uh, section, which is um, in this particular catalog, there was one 
1478 records and 22 percent belongs to this big part dance music and then um and this mu dance music uh, um, part was almost over the titles were in german mm -hmm. or in english and they were divided in two parts like modern dance and especially foxtrot tango english waltz slow fox blues boston jail and the latest dance which is paso doble fox Anglis, and quick step and then as ordinary dance they were waltz polka mazurka chardash quadrille and then cheska beseda and then was see the Czech records and then it was ordinary dance polo part and as they see among the Serbian and Croatian records so and then in the Slovenian records part it was special part in this catalog for example um represent just seven percent of the whole uh, records in this catalog and among them usually as like four trio records, you can find polka, waltz, traditional dance melodies, and so on. It was divided a little bit different. So in the whole catalog, you find a look. You can uh, in a Rasberger shop, you can buy or uh, a lot of uh, modern dances and ordinary dances tunes, and some also traditional dance. But we never know who really buy this record. So it's the possibility is the reality, it's not known to us. And the other, uh, on the other side, so in the public dance events, especially in the beginning of 20th century, we get like a Veselica event or some uh, local feast or something in the Dreptistern. You can, uh, you can read that there will be a music, a band who will play for dancing, but the gramophone, it was kind of attraction. It was not, uh, it was advertised as something attraction, as it was rifle or something other things that happened at these festivities. And not a supplement for a live music. Other thing is the private small scale dance events. We have some interrupters that say that, but this was the inform, uh, this was information usually after Second World War that in a rural area, sometimes gramophone records replay the live music in occasion if there were no uh, musicians there. So, um, so how did early gramophone records influence traditional dance? So we know the traditional dance melodies were among Slovenian record music, among Slovenians and Slovenian diaspora, and that gramophone record catalogs have dance music and Slovenian records with dance, Slovenian dance music. But to which extent it was used for dancing, we are not sure, we can just assume. But for sure, we know that some traditional musicians also listen to the records and sometimes learn from them, like repertoire, performing style, aesthetic. In my personal opinion, I think it was most important or most important to introduce new tunes, to introduce new dance the genre as to, to refer to already what is inhabited in your tradition, like traditional uh, things. So my final remark will be that nevertheless, dance is social activity. And usually it's not, you are not dancing alone at home because you need at least a, a partner or a group to do polo or whatever, or partner dance, uh, couple dance. And the dance event consists of dance and the music and their interplay, interviewing the constant negotiation between the dancer and the musician. So, uh, for many dancers, still today, live music is an idol, but gramophone records were a suitable, thought not complete, uh, sus, sus, substitute. substitute when the live music was not available. So if we go to this uh, advertising, it was at home, it was at, uh, yeah. 
So dance music in your own home, it was for learning new or uh, new dances or for pleasure. So I'm still looking for this answer. Thank you. So thank you very much. And now we will have the last presentation. Okay, so uh, uh, I will touch another uh, part of uh, our research, and I will try to, to talk about new genres and how can actually, uh, what can we learn from the 78s about possible new genres. Uh, you probably, or at least some of, uh, of yours, are familiar with a new genre which appears in the 1950s, so after the Second World War in, in Slovenia, and is actually not only in Slovenia, but very popular in this Arctic region of Central Europe. In Slovenia, we call it Narodno Zabalna Glasba, in German uh, language, Oberkreiner Musik or in uh, usually in English is translated like Slovenian folk pop music. So it's based on traditional music, but it's a really a new genre, uh, very popular even today among young uh, people. And uh, Gramophone Records has a very important role in this genre, as you can see here uh, in the middle of the picture of Brother Ausenix, who are the one of most important, most uh, well-known uh, artists. And I'm not going to talk about this kind of I'm going to talk of, about a similar genre uh, called polka music, which is a new music genre which appears in the uh, United States among the immigrants from Europe. And it's also based on traditional music, which were from homelands. They brought this uh, music from homelands. And it's actually traditional based dances like polkas, waltzes, Scots, Scottish, mazurkas, and many others, and also songs. So that the name polka music is maybe not the best, because this is not the only polka, it's much more. But it's a general name for this new genre, even today. What is maybe interesting or very important that this genre is based on tradition, but it's interweaving with the popular genres in the United States of those days. <coughs> so uh, uh, it is some kind of combination. And uh, polka music uh, is or is still performed by musicians of different nationalities. Uh, among them are Slovenians, Polish, Czech, German and others, and even they call of the, there are different styles of polka music. One of most in, uh, well known are Chicago or Polish style, or Cleveland or Slovenian style. And you can see here two very well known uh, musicians, artists of this kind of uh, music. I will talk a little bit about Frank Jankovic or Frankie Yankovic, as is pronounced in the United States. But I, my focus here is actually about this center, you know. If we have an traditional music in, in one uh, way, we have a polka music in another way, and then we have historical uh, commercial recordings in our case 78. I will, I'm interested in how actually this is in the center or what can 78 us help to understand <coughs> of development of this polka music in the United States uh, in, by immigrants. If we touch a little bit uh, about Slovenia recordings in the United States, Rebecca already said something. We, we know that there was a lot of immigrants from Europe in a certain period 
and gramophone uh, record company saw a, a great potential for, for buyers. Uh, so there was a special catalog, special series uh, for foreign speaking or ethnic music uh, for this kind of uh, immigrants. Huh? If I touch a little bit of Slovenia and especially in Cleveland, uh, from a 1910 census, we can uh, find out that more than 40,000 Slovenians live in Cleveland only. And it is interesting that Cleveland was of those days the, the third largest city of Slovenia. So the first were Ljubljana, second Trieste, the third Cleveland, you know, and then many others in Slovenia. So many immigrants. And of course, immigrants, Slovenians made a lot of recordings and as uh, uh, Beka already mentioned, there were quite a few uh, Slovenian language catalogs uh, with Slovenian records, or at least the records who were intent for performers or for buyers uh, in Slo uh, Slovenian immigrants. Uh, there are also sometimes nice uh, pictures. You can see some clothes, so it's, identity or something connected also in, in the picture, uh, not only with the sound. So, so Slovenia, crime, music, music. Cleveland was later called uh, America's polka capital uh, because in Cleveland, there was the largest settlement of Slovenians in the United States. Uh, I don't want to go to the details and to all these uh, members, but as I illustrated already. Uh, very important for Slovenian immigrants were national homes. So there were social cult cultural centers where they have concerts, they, they have plays, uh, they have dances, very important, uh, especially during 20s and 30s. So many Slovenians, many immigrants, and not only Slovenians, also other immigrants, other people attended to these tests. And seven such cult existed in 90s already, also all in, in Cleveland only. So it really, uh, uh, it was important. Another important uh, thing was music or is still music for uh, Slovenian immigrants. Uh, so in Cleveland was founded more than 40 singing, singing group only in Cleveland. And especially very welcome were accordion players in, in, in Slovenian society. So it is maybe not strange that polka music actually uh, started uh, in Cleveland and in among Slovenians, this Cleveland style or Slovenian style. If we talk about the pioneers uh, of this new kind of uh, polka music or new genre, we should certainly should mention Matija Arko or Matt Hoyer, uh, which Rebecca explained a little more about him, and William Lauche. So let's, uh, I don't want to repeat everything. So this is Matija Arko or Matt Hoyer, how he was uh, named in the uh, United States. Uh, he and his music, his band, so Hoyer Trio, was really, I think, the most popular uh, band in Cleveland. And I just mentioned more, maybe this because we have uh, interesting information that the, uh, their first record, recorded in 1924, uh, they were sold then more in 2,200 copies. If I will today make a record, I will be very happy to solve 300 <laughs> copies. <laughs> I know this is a, it was a different time, but I'm surprised. Yeah. And uh, as Rebecca uh, already said, uh, they play, they could play very traditional. And here is one example, just to refresh it. <laughs> Yeah, they were so popular.
popular and and the, also the recordings were so popular then the, the record companies started thinking uh, to find new target audience or uh, to sell records to another uh, nationalities so we can see here some example maybe uh, here two labels uh tc moya valcek so this is uh slovenian for slovenian community it says here slovenia you can see this from the catalog number and the same song with the same uh matrix number for the bohemian uh, target uh, audience uh, completely different title ajrano uh Huyevske trio so a little bit change of that. but we have here some more uh, maybe just one example here primorsky valcek so slovenian they were also uh reissued for italian as amore campagno and the, there was not a uh, performance what not hoyer trio but a tre scosesi there was a uh, for uh, attention for uh, or the the, the target num, um, audience uh, polish sive oczy the same yeah. and orchestri harmony was the performer and for scandinavian interesting scandinavian uh, uh, audience which was Gama Vastogata, I don't know the name. <laughs> and uh, the, the performer was translated as Svenska Kapelle. So the oh. same recording for different. So this music comes international. Yeah? Uh, I think it was also because they play a lot of polkas, waltz, and only instrumental music, which was easier <laughs> to make international. And also because I said, uh, Hoya Trio, they can play very traditional, but they start also to make a new style. And that's why they are called the granddaddy, Matt Hoya, of the polka music, because they started to combine chromatic accordion. They used a banjo, guitar. You can see the picture Rebecca already mentioned. And the, they, they used uh, elements of popular music from the United States and they sound they can sound also like this <laughs> You get the picture, I think. Yeah. Uh, so another pioneer was uh, Bill Lausche, William Lausche. Uh, he he plays very good uh, uh, piano. He actually think uh, first thing to be a, a professional musician, but then later uh, he decided to be a dentist. And I was thought that he always sings when he make. Uh, in a, uh, <laughs> So when you, you were, were there, he was singing, whistling, and so he was very musician, a, a great composer, a great arranger, and he coaching singing groups in in Cleveland, and he even rehearsed some who uh, some of young young uh, musicians who later become most famous or Cleveland polka style musician artists, and his music uh, compositions arrangement are actually the material for Cleveland type polka orchestra still now. Uh, what was important or connected with 78, he was a member of the, the I, mean, I cannot say the band, maybe a duet. So he's uh, uh, here, Bill Loche, with his sister Josefina and the friend Mary Udovich. Sometimes he played accordion in the uh, 78s, or sometimes they only, yeah. uh, sorry, piano, not accordion, piano, and sometimes he just uh, arranged music from them. And uh, what is uh, a new element, uh, they of course combined for the first time vocal and instrumental music, which was not uh, a traditional way uh, of in, in Slovenia. So this is one such arrangement. <laughs>
really like this new music, new genres, which was uh, popular in America in those days. And she also used this kind, and you will hear here uh, in this example what I mean. <laughs> And so on. And uh, among pioneers, I have to mention also Anton Merwart. He was not an artist, or he was an artist uh, in a different way, because he was a producer, a maker of accordion, but in box in Cleveland. He started to work in the factory Franz Lubas, very famous uh, accordion maker in, in Slovenia and later in Austria. And he moved uh, in 1920 in the United States in Cleveland, opened some years later his own factory and his uh, accordion was very famous, uh, even in Slovenia, because they were exported also to Slovenia. Them. But what is important, he also have a, a store Merwart's uh, music, it's called, where he sell first accordion and also other instruments and of course records and gramophones. And he was as usually, and we can say as uh, yesterday we discussed, he was also a middleman maybe, or uh, uh, re, um, uh, uh, that because he evaluated test pressing, and he also was a man who recommended recorded contracts for Cleveland-style musicians, including Matt Hoyer and uh, Lauchey Udovic, uh, and many others. So this store was not only a store, it was a meeting point, you know. A lot of musicians from all the Cleveland come there, talk about music, discuss, make, make also business, uh, but it was a cultural and business center. And he, uh, he makes a lot of help to, to become this kind of music also popular. And what is interesting here in this, uh, you can see here, uh, Harmonike is Delo a Merva. So it is on the label that accordion was made by Anton Merva. So you listen to the, this, this song and you can learn who was the, uh, who made this kind of accordion. And to conclude, the polka music uh, come to its it peak in uh, after the Second World War, maybe close to the 50s. It was Frankie Jankovic uh, of Slovenians who became first American polka king in 48. He has two gold records just because Blue Kurt Awards in 1948, 1999. He was awarded as a first ever Grammy in the best polka recording category in 86 and so on. So he was famous, very famous. And he usually said that polka is the happiest music this side of heaven. And here I will show how polka sounds some years later. Start to glide, then point your right foot, swing to the side, then for your partner, dip down below, then clap your hands and you're all set to go. It's the hokey pokey polka, or the hokey donkey too, with a ricky dicky rhythm, like a mocking bird in June, with a hokey dumpy tempo and a hurdy gurdy sound. It's a hokey pokey polka, they're playing all around. And so on. So this is what's happened later and somehow to conclude. So if I start with my question, how can 78 or if 78 could help us to understand this kind of new genre, I will certainly say yes. 
And I can say the records could be a very good scholarly resource, especially a companion with metadata and additional information. And through this kind of uh, records, we can also uh, reveal this diaspora experience to search for the sense of new identity and multi in this multicultural society. And that 78 actually are sounding example of lowly commercialization of traditional music and the development of new genre. And if I conclude, with the words of uh, Pekka Grono, that 78s are actually the largest archive of historical recordings in the world. And I will only say that it is really worth to study this material and to preserve this material. And I'm very happy that we are doing this also and during this symposium. Thank you very much. Yeah.